Welcome to the Andrew Colette Show. I'm going to attempt a hardcore Nuzlocke using only electric type Pokemon. I'm only going through the base game of Pokemon Shield, which means the electric types from the DLC will not be considered as encounters. This leaves 14 different lines of evolution to be obtained throughout the game. Here are the rules of this playthrough. First, when a Pokemon faints, it's dead, meaning I can't use it anymore. Second, I can only catch the first electric type encounter from each route or area, none from max battles. Third, no items in battle, but held items are okay. Fourth, set battle mode, meaning no free switch in when an enemy Pokemon is defeated. And fifth, no leveling past the next gym leader's ace Pokemon until the start of that battle. I will also be playing with the species clause, meaning I can only use one of each evolution line. One great thing about electro types is they only have the ground weakness. However, most of the ones available in Galar have very poor physical defense, which feels like a weakness in itself. I chose Sobble as the starter since I felt like giving Hop, Scorbunny, and Leon Grookey would be appropriate rival starters since Sobble was the one that has a weakness to electric types and is mainly a special attacker. I was thinking that Grubbin would be the real starter of the game, but it's technically not an electric type until it evolves. I would make an exception to this if Chargebug wasn't available later or if it shared a route or area with another encounter, but that's not the case here. Therefore, Yamper is the starter. I'm going with a Spider-Man villain name theme this playthrough, so I name it Yellow Goblin. It's one of the few physical attack encounters I can have, so of course it has a nature decreasing its attack power. To ready Yellow Goblin for the journey, some Max Raid Battle should provide some XP candy. Choodle's weak to electric, right? So this should be a breeze. Our Max Nuzzle attacks are so weak, and here comes the Max Geyser after the Dynamax is over. <laughs> well, I guess I lost my first attempt. Anyways, attempt two, I get a Yamper that doesn't have an attack decreasing nature, so maybe that death was a blessing in disguise. And she did a great job catching this Electrike from West Lake Axwell, which I name Electro. On the other side at East Lake Axwell, Joltik is added to the team and named Venom, cause come on, it's a spider. And let me tell you, this cute little spider is faster, stronger, and bulkier than its other two team members somehow. So this was a great surprise early game carrying me over the beginning hurdles such as Team Yell and Hop. After raising the team to level 15, we're ready to catch Pikachu at the rolling fields. Since I like to make my Raichu thick in competitive battles, I name her Kingpin. There's a Thunderstone available in the early part of the wild area, so Pika grows up fast. This is also a great advantage early game because in Generation 8, the Move Relearner is available right away and for free. So I have access to its entire learn set move pool already since Kingpin can't learn any moves by leveling up. So already during Bead's first battle, I'm already doing setup strats with Light Screen, Nasty Plot, then a Thunderbolt Sweep. We take those. Now in Route 4, I make an exception for catching Eevee, since Jolteon and Rotom share their encounter at the Lake of Outrage. And to stay true to being mono-electric, I go straight to the digging duo until they find me a Thunderstone, introducing Jolteon to the team, and is named Black Cat. And he is put to work right away, even though Black Cat has a poor physical attack stat, it's fine for the first gym since they're not that strong anyways. Against Milo and equipping our Jolteon with Expert Belt, I spam that pin missile button until Goss of Flower is gone. Then the Dynamax Showdown with Elder Goss is a max full air buy and max strike exchange, with Black Cat bringing home the W, earning our first gym badge. And what do you know, just like my last Nuzlocke, we're getting Toxel from the daycare again on Route 5, this time being named Lizard. Adorable Venom takes care of Team Yell again, and Kingpin flexes this nasty plot Thunderbolt combo against Top. At the second gym town, Hillbury, we fish for a Chin Chow at the docks and name her after my favorite Spider-Man villain, Mysterio. But Kingpin is going to have the spotlight against Nessa with, you guessed it, a nasty plot setup. Only getting hit by one horn attack, Raichu one-hit KOs Goldeen, Aracuda, and even their Dynamax Dreadnought with just one max lightning each. Two badges down, six to go. You wanna know a weird fact? That squishy, bubbly thing Bead has? Yeah. That has more power than Lugia. Was someone high at Game Freak when making that? I don't know. But isn't Venom so cute soloing against Bead? And against Team Yell too, of course. Anyways, Yellow Goblin evolves into Boltund along the way. Now we got a legit physical attacker. Now Marnie's a little scary to me since her whole team are physical attackers, so I can't just set up Nasty Plot willy-nilly because look at Kingpin's horrendous defense stat. She doesn't really fit the big guy persona. So I have her attack straight away with Thunderbolt, taking out Crow Gunk in one hit. Scraggy in two hits, and let's watch versus Morpeko. All that. Bite would probably be the worst one. Okay. Don't crit, please. <gasps> no, no, no! Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! 
For those that have seen my last Nuzlocke, which was also my first, Marnie killed three of my mons in that playthrough, so I gotta make sure to prep for her, especially with my physically weak team. Before facing the third gym leader, Kabu, Mysterio evolves into Lantern and is now ready to lead the battle. Ninetales starts by Will-O-Wisping, which I don't care since Mysterio is a special attacker and responds with Bubble Beam. Then they Fire Spin, which doesn't do much and the residual damage isn't a thing since Ninetales is wiped out by another Bubble Beam. Arcanine comes in bringing the Bite action, Mysterio again with the Bubble Beam. Then I decide to Dynamax to set up the rain after their bite triggers my Citrus Berry and the turn ends with Max Geyser. Now something I didn't realize about Senta Scorch, its attack stat of 115 was a lot higher than I expected that little bug to have. Not only that, but Max Flutter Bite also weakens Mysterio's special attack causing us not even to take half of their HP. I Max Guard the next turn to stall out their second Dynamax turn, but now have to possibly sacrifice someone to save our water type. Black Cat takes the plunge, but thankfully no critical hit. And here's another mistake I overlooked about Senta Scorch. After Yellow Goblin swaps in, they bug bite, meaning it eats our Citrus Berry. I take the risk, keeping Bolt Tund in. Well, it did coil the turn before, raising its attack. Thus, Yellow Goblin is gone, but at least she made the path easy for Raichu to finish off the third gym. At least we get to capture two more encounters soon after in Hammerlock Hills, being Chargebug and his name Shocker, then at Giant's Mirror, Helioptile is caught and named Sandman, which is fitting with the Sand Veil ability. Shortly after, a Sudden Stone is found nearby evolving Sandman into Heliolisk. And I forgot to mention this thing has crummy defense like most of the team. And once again, I have the digging duo find another Thunderstone evolving Shocker into Vicavolt. Which is nice, since he's bulkier and now has the Levitate ability avoiding ground attacks. Since the level cap has jumped up to level 36, I can grind a bit to prepare by hunting Glooms that also each give my Pokemon plus two special attack EVs for each one we knock out. And now, Lizard is a Toxtricity. With every Team Yell battle comes Nick excuse to see that cute little venom in action. But better yet, Route 6 brings us our fossil encounter which I choose to be Dracozolt and name it Dr. Octopus. The doc's defensive dragon typing is so great along with being a sole physical attacker of the team now. But it's benched to get the free XP as the Kingpin plows through Hop's team. Now to face the fourth gym leader Alistair. The plan was, and I say again, was simple. Kingpin sets up the reflect then switches in Black Cat to Shadow Ball their team. But for some reason I decide to give Kingpin a chance to nasty plot twice, kind of wasting my valuable reflect turns. Then I Thunderbolt when Yamask is a ground type. They've been chipping at Kingpin's HP and Yamask is taken out with two grass knots. Oh boy, it's Mimikyu. Yeah, let's get Kingpin out of there. Dang, it's like they read the switch and used Home Claws to boost their attack. After a slash and a rock blast, our reflect is now gone. Doc Ock chips back with Aerial Aces while Mimikyu weakens the Doc's attacks with Baby Doll Eyes. With Mimikyu finished, Cursula is next, which I swap in Black Cat, taking the Hex Attack. I have the Cat to protect every other turn to heal back up with Leftovers, but their Cursula responds with Curse, meaning they lose half of their HP, but Jolteon loses one quarter of his HP every turn. I gotta save Black Cat for Gengar, so Mysterio takes a turn being hit by Hex. Mysterio is slow, but the dead Cursula is even slower and is thunderwaved into full paralysis. Now hopefully Black Cat can switch in on a paralysis turn, but no, there's the Hex. A Shadow Ball should do it from here. Woo! Too close! Now the final face off with Gengar. A Max Phantasm gets the major critical hit, almost one hit KOing, and then Black Cat easily soaks the Max Ooze. Thankfully with his amazing speed, Gengar is bested, claiming our fourth gym badge, halfway done with the gym challenge. Now I gotta interrupt Bead being a jerk, and this time having our other bug type Shocker do all the work rather than Venom. While battling the six gym trainers, I accidentally overleveled Lizard and Kingpin, which means they're going to be in the box until we get that badge. Was mainly bummed about Lizard since he's a poison type missing out on the fairy gym, but I think I can do this with no one dying still. Black Cat leads the charge with a Thunderbolt and thankfully no poison from that sludge bomb. Another Thunderbolt faints wheezing along with the Opal speed boost. Remember, we gotta protect every other turn to heal from leftovers. Black Cat activates the early Dynamax to one-hit KO Mawile instead of the Electric Terrain, boosting future electric attacks. After Opal's additional boost raises our defenses, and just like planned, Max Lightning takes out Togekiss. Now the Max Lightning doesn't take down G-Max Alchemy quite as easily due to its high special defense. Their attack doesn't do much either, but does heal themselves. Black Cat should be able to soak non-crits with the boost he's gotten before. After their G-Max ends, Opal doubles our power, we exchange the Thunderbolt while they confuse us with a sweet kiss. But Black Cat holds it together and ends the Fairy Gym Challenge. The next battle is a match I prepared for more than the past gym, and that's Hop. I know I've given this guy crap in the past, but look at his team, all physical attackers. Once again, my team doesn't like that, so let's check out my plan. Kingpin starts by setting up Reflect, while holding Light Clay, extending the screens for 8 turns, so she should be safe unless it's a critical hit. Which of course, the Horn Leech crits us, but she survives 
lives, thankfully. Time to Volt Switch into Black Cat, who takes the Horn Leech much better. Next step of the plan is to double our speed with agility, and there's that annoying Confuse Ray. I now Baton Pass to transfer the doubled speed stats along with the unfortunate confusion to Doc Ock. And what the heck is with these crits? Doc Ock is all we need now, and also holding the Expert Belt, increasing super effective attacks by 20%. A few aerial aces and snapping out confusion leads to Trevenant's demise. Now for the low kick tech. Since Snorlax is one fatty, taking more damage from the attack, but not enough for a one hit. They body slam, then Doc kicks them off the field. Boltund would be faster, but we got that agility boost, so Earthquake annihilates them first. The same goes for Heatmore, and the battle ends with another Earthquake crushing Cinderace. I think that's going to be the typical strategy going forward for physical attacking teams. Speaking of physical attackers, our next encounter from Route 7 is Morpeko. Also cool that she's a dark type, which I named Vulture. Soon after on Route 8, I encounter Togedemaru, who I really want because of that steel typing. But she doesn't seem to want to come with us, because she keeps breaking out of all my different kinds of Pokeballs, including one Quick Ball, all of my Ultra Balls, Great Balls, Dusk Balls. Luckily, I gave Doc Ock leftovers before this with Protect so I could stay alive and heal. Then I busted out the secret weapon I didn't even know I had, the Love Ball. Black Cat's male gender is opposite than the encounter, making it 8 times more effective. Dang, she played hard to get. Took 31 turns, and I named her Rhino. But she was so worth it, and is a main start against Melanie, the Ice Gym Leader. A simple Iron Head one-hit KOs Frostmoth and Galarian Darmanitan. I have to change up things with Ice Cube because of the Ice Face, essentially giving itself an extra life. By U-turning, bringing in Black Cat. It's like they knew what I was going to do since they used Tail, which gives them another Ice Face. Black Cat sets up a Light Screen while holding Light Clay, which will help us tank their special attacks like that Icy Wind. Since our speed is dropping per their Icy Winds, two Thunderbolts should leave Ice Cube with a sliver of health so the cat can bolt switch to get someone in with an unaffected speed. Oh, that critical hit shocking the penguin to death is bad. Now I got a slow Jolteon versus their Gigantamax Lapras, but I worried about the speed for nothing since Lapras was potato slow. Black Cat stalls their Dynamax by Max Guarding, then hits with a Max Lightning, gets smacked in return by a G-Max Resonance, effectively putting up their own screens, and one more Max Guard to end their Dynamax turns. To keep Black Cat safe, I volt switch having Mysterio take its place, who resists both of their upcoming attacks, being Icy Wind and Surf. Mysterio electrifies us to victory with a discharge, claiming our sixth badge. Time for the second to last hop battle. I go in with the same strategy in mind like last time, but Double messes things up with a growl, decreasing our attack stat. I don't want that to be passed to Doc Ock. So now it's this game of Ring Around the Rosie with Mysterio and Back to Black Cat, but they growl again. Let's give Lizard a turn attacking with Volt Switch, getting the KO and changes places with Rhino since she can withstand most of Hop's team, uh, except for that Cinderace, which of course is setting out. So I have to switch here for Mysterio to resist the incoming Pyro Ball. Then they attack with Mega Kick, and thankfully Mysterio ends the Bunny's time with only one Surf. Obviously, I swap in Doc Ock to save Mysterio from the Body Slam. Now give him a low kick, Doc. That's better. The match is a wrap at this point, biting Corviknight with two Thunderfangs and crushing Pinkurchin with an Earthquake. On to Route 9, Pinkurchin is our second last counter. And I honestly don't know what I'm going to do with this thing. It's slow and frail, so maybe I can sacrifice it for later? I don't know. Oh yeah, his name is Scorpion. Another second to last thingy event, whatever you want to call it, a Marnie battle. Remember that strategy that was supposed to work against Hop? Well, it works perfectly against Marnie. She did have some of her mons use Torment and Swagger, which could have maybe thrown things off a little, but they didn't come into full effect, giving us that easy W. Alright, now it's time for the no Dynamax gym leader peers. All of his team are physical attackers. Seems to be a common theme lately. The plot this time is to have Kingpin be the sweeper. I do this by charming three times, lowering his damage output to a quarter of his strength, which protects in between to heal from leftovers. Then Black Cat Volt switches out for Kingpin to, uh, I forgot to teach Kingpin nasty plot before this. Well, that was a waste of time. Could have just attacked with four times super effective draining kiss from the beginning. Okay, you can't beat Malamar with your poor defense. Volt switch out of there. What? They went for foul play? That does decent damage. Luckily, I also gave Doc Ock leftovers and protect to heal in between turns. Unfortunately, one Dragon Claw doesn't defeat Malamar, so Doc Ock is going to have to sit on the bench the rest of this round after another hit from foul play. After stalling a couple heal turns, Black Cat returns to the field. It's important to send a special attacker against Opsagoon since it has the move counter. Now's the moment to weaken them with three attracts like we did at the beginning of the battle, while healing in between and praying for no crits. Volt Switch allows Shocker to enter the fray, and look at this. <laughs> Another team member with leftovers and protect. Attack with Bug Buzz! Or not, since Throat Chop disabled that move for a couple turns. Thunderbolt does fine damage anyways, but I have a Shocker knock them out with a Volt Switch to once again bring in Black Cat to diminish their chances with three attracts. 
No need to switch this time since he's safe and secures us a shocking victory with no deaths. How have I not used a pun until now? Anyways, Ryan is the last gym leader in my way and he's always my favorite part of the game since the doubles battle takes a different mindset and preparing and making plays. Kingpin sets up the reflect, anticipating physical attacks like Flygon's breaking swipe. Mysterio then strikes with a four times super effective ice beam, shattering Flygon to death. Gigalith ends the turn setting up Stealth Rock, which will damage my Pokemon every time they switch in. Long term plan is to take out the Snake and Rock at the same time so Duraludon will face us alone. Thinking Gigalith is the bigger threat, we double target him, which is nice since Sanaconda used to protect. Kingpin Volt switches into Black Cat. Mysterio pulls off the awesome burn with a Scald, cutting in half the damage from Body Press. Sanaconda fails a second protect. Black Cat speeds up with agility for reasons I bet you can guess by now. Mysterio scalded Santa Cotton close to death, which is what I want, and I knew Ryan had a few ground attacks up his sleeve, so I gave four of my six party members Shuka Berries, which cuts in half the damage from a super effective ground attack. I think that they think that Mysterio is a threat, so I have her protect, and Black Cat Baton passes the speed to Doc Ock, which gets hit by Earth Power and a Body Press, kind of shaking up my plans for my dragon. In order to get ready for Duraludon, Doc Ock Dynamaxes and attacks with Max Knuckle, KOing Santa Conda while increasing increasing our attack power. Mysterio also KOs Gigalith with Volt Switch bringing in Black Cat. To make sure neither of them die, I have Black Cat Charm Duraludon and Doc Ock Max Wormwind resulting in G-Max Duraludon losing 3 stages of attack power. This on top of Haban Berry which cuts in half the damage from a super effective dragon attack saves the doctor's life from death. Max Quake is curtains for the 8th gym badge qualifying us for the champions cup. Now I gotta be careful with the level cap here since it only goes from 48 to 49 for the semifinals. So I have some of the bench warmers tag along during route 10. Venom evolves into Galvantula along the way. The champions cup begins begins with our last Marnie battle starting with Black Cat vs Lipard. I just spam Thunderbolt while they use Nasty Plot, a full restore, and another Nasty Plot. With Scrafty being next, I use Agility to set up, but they cancel it out with Scary Face. Trying again didn't work, so let's weaken them with Charm nerfing that crunch. Let's try Agility again, but they swagger me, which doesn't compel me to Baton Pass. A normal switch will have to do for now because Black Cat would have been Scary Faced anyways. Doc Ock tanks two crunches and flaps Scrafty away with two Aerial Aces. Toxicrow could have been a threat with Swagger but they use Venoshock instead, to which the Doc responds with a massive earthquake. Now Morpeko does not scare Doc Ock, but Grimmsnarl does, so I need Rhino to take care of this instead. Their bite chipped off more than I would have liked to, but Leftovers helps out a bit. I got a Dynamax now though, to avoid a possible flinch from another bite and to max Flutterby for a one hit KO. Now Grimmsnarl isn't that intimidating, however they do survive the first max steel spike, but respond with a max starfall, which is fine, resulting in Marnie being defeated for the last time. The final rival battle brings back the Reflect, Agility Baton Pass Strategy. Maybe instead of explaining every time, I'll just make it an acronym. RAB. I don't know. We're getting close to the end anyways. The Chunky Snorlax did give me a little scare surviving the low kick by replying with a high horsepower, but we good. Pincurching, get out of here. What do you even do? Dynamax Doc Ock to strike down Corviknight with one hit and end the match with one Max Quake into Cinderace. Oh, I guess it will take two Max Quakes to qualify us for the finals. But before that, we must face Oleana to progress the story. Now I'll use the acronym, RAB. So you can guess where this is going. <gasps> Gosh! Dang, that critical hit did me dirty. Kingpin was definitely an all-star this playthrough. At least she did her part for Black Cat to progress the plan. It still doesn't go perfectly since Frostlass uses Icy Wind to lower our speed by one stage, and Black Cat needs to take out Frostlass since Doc Ock is weak to ice. So equipping him with Shadow Ball was a good idea. My Lodic is sent in next, and I figure, what the heck, Black Cat can do this one too. Thunderbolt while they waste their time with Aqua Ring, and another Thunderbolt fries them. Salazzle? You could do this one too, buddy. Thunderbolt from us, Vino Shock from them, Citrus Berries activated in heals, and one more Thunderbolt. Serena signals to me that it's time to baton pass the speed over to Doc Ock, who also isn't affected by their attract move. Yet, Doc disappoints with a Fire Fang miss, and is hit by a Trop Kick lowering our attack. Darn it! So now Fire Fang won't kill right away and she keeps drop kicking us continuing to lower our attack stat. Change of plans, I need to pivot in Rhino which luckily is only hit by Stomp, not affecting her attack stat. But I can't have Rhino hang around either since she's 4 times weak to a possible ground attack from Garbodor. So she switches back Doc Ock hoping for no drop kick but of course that's what she does and HP is going down. I guess Lizard will have to come in and volt switch ending that annoying Serena. The rest of the team is not properly built to face Garbodor. After some calculations, Mysterio may have the best chance. First, stall out turn 1 of Dynamax with Max Guard. Second, take in a hard hitting Max Quake and Max Geyser back. Third, Max Guard the last Dynamax turn. Fourth, hope for no Gunk Shot or Stomping Tantrum. There's the Gunk Shot. I didn't want to lose you yet, pal, but at least you kept Doc Ock alive who finishes the bloody battle with an Earthquake. 
Dang, I got ripped apart that battle. Can't believe I lost two mons to Oleana. At least there's one more encounter for us, and that is Rotom at the Lake of Outrage. The last nickname is Hobgoblin. Sadly though, it's level 58, meaning it's above the level cap when starting the finals. Technically before that though is Beat's Battle, so I lead with Lizard to take the Intimidate rather than one of my physical attackers. Then Volt switch into Rhino, who tanks the Crunch and causes Mawau to faint from Iron Barb's damage. To keep Rhino safe, she stalls with Protect to heal from leftovers, then one-shots Gardevoir with Iron Head. Then to ensure the one-hit KO against Rapidash, she Dynamaxes getting hit by a small Psycho Cut, then obliterates with Max Steel Spike. Gigantamax Hatterene is going to take two attacks to knock out, but I got a little careless here and accidentally let Rhino die from a Max Flare. Freak! I still had plans for you, Rhino. I'm so sorry. Lizard easily wipes Hatterene with two Sludge Bombs after they use Full Restore, thankfully avenging our Rhino buddy. Now, if you watched my first Nuzlocke, Ness's Barrascuto is faster than my Toxtricity, even with the 50% speed boost it got from Choice Scarf. This time I don't make that mistake and Eevee train him to be faster. The battle is now cake by spamming Overdrive and ending with a Max Lightning against Shrednaw. Easy peasy. Since Kingpin doesn't exist anymore, I have to change the acronym for the strategy. It's now CAB, C-A-B. Black Cat starts off against Dusknor, using Charm, lowering his attack while he uses Rock Tomb, which is kind of annoying because I'm going to have to use Agility twice to make up for lost speed, and he'll likely Rock Tomb some more. Thankfully, during the process, Leftovers helps out. Then a couple Shadow Balls takes out Dusknor. Now, I didn't Baton Pass yet because Chandelure has Will-O-Wisp, which would cut in half our attack damage. So Black Cat takes care of this guy too with a couple Shadow Balls. Actually, I'm going to keep delaying the baton pass since Pulti guys could set up with nasty plot. So here's another two shadow balls. Okay, now I have to switch with Baton Pass because Black Cat's Burn doubles Cursula's Hex Power, so Vulture swaps in resisting the Ghost Attack and has her special defense boosted 50% thanks to holding Assault Vest. Vulture Dynamaxes to shatter Cursula's Sad Life with a mighty Max Darkness. Gigantamax is not a threat either since Vulture has a speed boost from Black Cat and massacres the opponent with one Max Darkness as well. Now against Ryan, I make a silly preparation mistake. When I looked up his team, I looked up the wrong set. I saw the one that was meant for his team later, so I played careful with Charm this battle because I was afraid of a gyro ball, which is more powerful the slower you are against the foe. And Torkoal is potato slow and Jolteon is lightning fast. But no, this Torkoal has yawn. Flip. Black Cat pulls out a Shadow Ball before falling asleep, then Torkoal starts hitting with Solar Beams and Body Presses. This isn't good. Time to pivot. Doc Ock comes in early, soaking a Solar Beam. Earthquake doesn't quite take them out, and now the Doc is drowsy from a yawn. To avoid falling asleep, Lizard swaps in while they heal with a Full Restore. I don't know if that crit mattered from Lizard's attack, but at least Torkoal's gone. Ah shoot, I did not want to see Flygon this early. I haven't used her much at all, so level 40 Sandman is going to have to sack it for the team here. I'm not bummed about it, since that's what I always plan to use her for, but it didn't have have to happen if I knew Torkoal was going to have Yawn. I don't want to use my Dynamax this early, but I have to so Doc Ock doesn't lose too much HP from the Earthquake. In response, Max Wormwind whirls Flygon out of there. Tritonator is a slow poke, so Max Wormwind here gets the one-hit KO as well, and Gujar suffers the same fate as its two predecessors did. Our Dynamax ends as theirs begins. I know the Doc can live one Dragon Attack thanks to holding Haban Berry. They actually use Max Rockfall though because Raihan wanted to tell me about the power of a Sandstorm. I actually gave Doc Ock Earth Power even though its special attack isn't that great, since Duraludon's special defense is way worse. Okay, Duraludon should use G-Max Depletion now, so it's Venom's turn to take a hit, and he thankfully survives. Since Venom is a bug type, I predict the Max Rock fall, so Vulture enters the arena and survives the smackdown as well. Now I hope for a body press since Vulture is a dark type and Volt switches, trading places with Lizard, barely getting hurt from the attack. Choice Scarf Lizard outspeeds Duraludon, winning us the Champions Cup Finals. Crazy to think that before the cup started, I only lost one Pokemon, but four more have died since then. At least I get a break now against Chairman Rose. His team mainly consists of slow steel types. And I get to use Rotom now. Doc Ock is a great pick here since Fire Fang is four times super effective against both S Cavalier and Ferrothorn. Even Berserker is screwed because of an earthquake, as is Clean Clang, but I'm actually glad they survived so Hobgoblin can come in with the power of the microwave, Dynamaxing to summon the Harsh Sun with a Max Flare. That way, Gigantamax Copperaja can't even live one boosted Max Flare attack. Now before I face the dreadful Eternatus, such a demon requires a sacrifice, and that sacrifice is Electro the Manectric. Electro's goal is simple, scary face Eternatus so the rest of the team can be faster. I gave her a focus dash just in case, but she didn't need it. And even paralyze Eternatus with the static ability. Good job Electro, setting up the extra credit light screen. Your deaths allowed others to live. But it's not over yet. While Zashian faints and Hop is lollygagging with double kicks, ugh. Black Cat comes close to death. 
So the mighty Hobgoblin, this time holding Assault Vest, takes his place, helping Zamazenta eventually take down the Gargantuan. Wanting Hobgoblin to be part of the final battle, I invested 26 HP up pills into the microwave. It had to be done, since its EV stats had hardly been affected by so few battles. Leon, it's time. I plan on using the entire team this battle, since every member has its flaws against Leon's team, but each also has at least one advantage. The match starts with Black Cat charming Aegislash to weaken attacks like the Sacred Sword. They then defend when the cat pulls off an agility. I go for another charm, then Black Cat withstands the Shadow Ball and eats the Citrus Berry. One more charm should do it, and we live one more Shadow Ball. It's now the moment to Paton pass the speed boost to Hobgoblin. Unfortunately, the Shadow Ball on Switch in lowers our special defense. Wanting to get rid of them immediately now, I command a Dark Pulse, which is blocked. At least that helps us a little with leftovers healing at the end of each turn. With a bit of HP recovered, I advise Hobgoblin to set up a Nasty Plot, doubling its special attack power. Another Shadow Ball isn't enough to wipe out the Microwave. Let's wreck havoc with Dark Pulse now. Oh no, looks like Hobgoblin's time will be short with Haxorus here. Maybe Dark Pulse can flinch? Yes! Give them another Dark Pulse, baby. Okay, Rhyperior is not great to see either. Let's try to substitute since Stone Edge has a chance to miss. No freaking way, it missed! Even though the Dark Pulse doesn't flinch, the substitute allows Hobgoblin to live the Stone Edge and knock out Rhyperior with another Dark Pulse. Rillaboom is next, which is totally fine. Look at that, another Dark Pulse flinch. Give him the 1-2 Dark Pulse combo. Dragapult is what this move set was made for. So do I even need to explain? For the final boss Charizard, I max guard blocking the max rockfall, then attack with max darkness, and silly Leon throws his chance of winning in the garbage by deciding to G-max wildfire. The residual damage won't even take effect since Hobgoblin is a fire type. Stall the last turn of Dynamax and finish the entire run with a final Dark Pulse. Wow, the hacks were totally on my side during that finale. The journey is over, 14 encounters, 6 deaths. The Pokemon Shield Hardcore Nuzlocke Mono Electric Challenge is completed. Thanks for watching everyone, let me know in the comments if you would like to see another mono type hardcore Nuzlocke. Subscribe for more, like the video, let me know what you thought of the run or maybe some ideas you may have. If you want the live experience, be sure to follow me on Twitch, and you all have a good one. See ya!